For the Lord Jesus said, except you drink my blood and eat my flesh, that you'll have no part in me. When I take the Old Testament text and lay it in one hand and the New Testament revelation in the other, I begin to understand what's going on. For the Lord Jesus Christ's blood was the blood of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, except you drink this blood, you'll have no life in you. Then my friend, I say to myself, how do I get some of that blood to drink? Has anybody in this house ever had any of the blood of Christ that you might drink? Have you ever found the blood of Christ that you might take it into your body? You say, no, preacher, I cannot do that. And I know you can't. It does not exist on this earth. That Bible says that he entered in one time into the holy place with his own precious blood. That means that you cannot take wine or grape juice or anything else and wave your hand over it and say some words and turn it into the blood of Christ. That's not going to happen. That's transubstantiation. And that, my friend, is nothing but witchcraft and has nothing to do with the Word of God. John Paul's relic that they had was a vial containing blood. But now it says... Uh, Vatican observers see the decision to canonize both popes together as a master stroke designed to invite unity within the Roman Catholic Church since it brings together a conservative and a reformer. That's what they're trying to do. John the 23rd relic is a piece of skin removed from his body when it was exhumed. Blood and skin, guys, that's an evil satanic ritual. These two things are required to raise up an evil spirit, to call up a demon. And it is the worst that they've ever done because it's an end time version. What they did was call up the leader of the locust army in this event. It says Vatican spokesman said beforehand that as many as 150 cardinals, a thousand bishops, and 6,000 priests would attend the canonization. It says delegations from 100 companies, countries, 24 heads of state, large Jewish delegation to attend. A strange investigation is underway in Rome after a church was robbed Saturday. What did the thieves take? A relic containing a vial of blood from Pope John Paul II. The relic was at the church in the Abruzzo section of Italy where the Pope loved to go skiing. Dozens of police officers are on the case. They're using dogs to try to pick up a scent. I guess his secretary had taken a vial of his blood and gave it as a gift to the small church in the mountains of East Rome. This is where Pope John Paul liked to go and hike and to pray to Lucifer with all of his little boys and the rest of the Vatican Church and all the rest of the Jesuits. They took this blood, they put it in a small glass vial that was enshrined in a gold crucifix. According to NBC, police believe the theft was probably commissioned because the only thing stolen was the one relic with several other valuables left behind. So why steal his blood? Well, this is where things get kind of creepy. Police think the people who took it will try to use it for satanic rites instead of trying to sell it. International Business Times cited an Italian watchdog group that said the day the Pope's blood was stolen corresponds with the dominium or ownership of the demon Balak. Another theory, International Holocaust Remembrance Day is January 27th, and the Times says for some, this marks the beginning of rituals and preparation for Satan's birthday, February 1st. Let us first examine Roman Catholic belief. Once again, we are quoting from Roman Catholic sources. The first source to be quoted is from St. Thomas, reprinted in the Catholic book, Faith of Millions, by John O'Brien. He says, the power of consecrating, the supreme power of the priestly office, is the power of consecrating. No act is greater, says St. Thomas, than the consecration of the body of Christ. In this essential phase of the sacred ministry, the power of the priest is not surpassed by that of the bishop, the archbishop, the cardinal, or the pope. 
Indeed, it is equal to that of Jesus Christ. For in this role, the priest speaks with the voice and the authority of God himself. When the priest pronounces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, brings Christ down from his throne, and places him upon an altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. The belief is identical to standard witchcraft. Now pay attention. The only significant difference is that the witch has to very carefully bring the demon into the dimension because the demon is going to materialize cursing, spitting, and fighting. Whereas Jesus is pictured as coming into a realm in a loving manner. Guys, it has nothing to do with Jesus, and they're even lying as they're teaching the priest this. It has nothing to do with calling Jesus. It goes on to say that it is a power greater than that of monarchs, of emperors. It is greater than that of saints and angels, greater than that of seraphim and cherubim. It says the priests bring Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim. Are you listening? For the sins of man, not once, but a thousand times. Guys, this is what they're taught. Christ has nothing to do with this. They're calling up evil spirits. They don't have the power to call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior anywhere. You understand what I'm saying? They may think they are, but I doubt it. They're calling up Apollyon. Obviously, Jesus Christ does not want to go through the agony of the cross again, and he's not, guys. In witchcraft, the attraction to a person to learn the arduous and dangerous art of the craft is the belief that once the witch speaks, the right incantation has made the correct physical preparations, a demon must materialize into the dimension, must do the beating of the witch, even if it does not want to obey. The demon, not Christ, must obey. This is identical to the belief St. Thomas articulated, as even discerning Catholic priests will admit. The uh, teaching regarding the power of the priest over supernatural forces, in this case Jesus Christ, is identical to the witchcraft teaching regarding the power the witch has over supernatural forces, demons. In both cases, the supernatural being is forced to do that which they do not want to do uh, to serve the human who has control over them. In other words, the Catholic priest is just a witch dressed in different clothes. We were warned about familiar spirits. This is Google Maps. We're looking down on the Vatican. I want to zoom this down to St. Peter's Square. They took the flesh of one pope and the drip blood of another pope, and both they canonized. So as I researched this, I found out more about what they were doing. And what we're looking at at St. Peter's Square is actually a magic circle. And I'm going to explain that. In Wikipedia, it says a magic circle is a circle or sphere of space marked out by practitioners of many branches of ritual magic which they generally believe will contain energy and form a sacred space or will provide them a form of magical protection, or both. It may be marked physically, drawn in salt or chalk, for example, or merely visualized. Its spiritual significance is similar to that of a mandala or yantra in some Eastern religions. Now, it says these circles were traditionally believed by ritual magicians to form a protective barrier between themselves and what they had summoned, in this case Apollyon. In modern times, practitioners generally cast magic circles to contain and concentrate the energy they believe to raise during a ritual. You see all the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people pushed into that circle? It says there are many published techniques for casting a circle and many groups and individuals have their own unique method. The common feature of these practices is the boundary is traced around the working area. Some witchcraft traditions say there, uh, one must trace around the circle three times. There's a variation of which direction one should start. It's exactly like St. Peter's Square. There's three walkways in between the four rows of columns that you see in this circle. It says uh, circles may or may not be physically marked out on the ground in a variety of elaborate patterns for circle markings can be found in grimoires and magical manuals. 
Now, I do not endorse familiar spirits or talking in tongues. They're both demonic. But this is what we're dealing with. And the bottom is called a Yule Circle. Now, it goes and it's got the same pass. You've got uh, all the pass going left and right. That's not the only thing. Here in the call, the Wheel of Year is almost the exact replica. And it goes, it, you see the zodiac signs and everything. All of that's in St. Peter's Square. And they're big time on marking your east, west, north, south, and the quarters from just what I'm reading. It says, as the wheel turns, pagans celebrate eight days of Sabbath. Now look at this. Inside that circle of protection, you see that? And you see who's on the outside, who's on the inside. And guys, the Pope can give tickets to different areas of this St. Peter Square when they put the chairs and all, some in the circle, some out. They're free, but he gets to issue who sits where. Again, here, the Pope and his minions inside the circle while everyone outside. Now, if they call in a bunch of demons inside this circle, what are they doing? Are they calling them in to infest these people? Are they calling these people in to be protected? No, they're calling just in the inner circle is the protection they think. Probably the most obvious characteristic of a witch was the ability to cast a spell, being the word used to signify the means employed to carry out a magical action. They uh, traditionally were cast by many methods, such as the inscription of runes or sigils on an object to give it magical powers, by the immolation of, or binding of a wax clay or clay image of a person to affect him or her magically, by the recitation of incantations, by the performance of physical rituals, by the employment of magical herbs as amulets, or by gazing at mirrors, swords, or other speculi. You ever seen him do it? Check this out, Francis. He's intensely gazing into that sun disc. Remember the sun god, Ra and Apollyon? Look what he's doing. Look what he's doing there. Now listen, the four cardinal directions are often prominently marked, with, such as with four candles in ceremonial magic traditions. The four directions are commonly related to the four angels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, or Uriel, or Oriel, are the four classical elements. They mark it east, west, north, and south. Notice how this is, circle is lined with all of these statues all the way around it. And I call them demonic statues because they are. They're demons. They are the any of these people that were these child molesters are demons. Guys, this is an old German painting. It shows a priest in the circle. The angel's on the outside with the protection of the innocent. Now, notice the circle is gone in this image. The wall is cracked behind it, untempered mortar by lying preachers. That, and the demons come in bottom panel all hell breaks loose they were talking about this back then it was a warning so now we have this occult satanic church calling in apollyon that's what you're seeing guys the leaders of the world the leaders of religion from around the world were here to witness this listen when they call up this evil as the truth is being spoken you're going to start seeing it more and more each day you're going to see more anger more kind of confusion more strange looks in their eyes the locust army is on the move heads up be safe